So welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Fabian Crane and I'm here with Frederike Ernst. Today we're going to speak with Harry Halpin and Jaya Clara Brecke, who are the CEO and CSO of NIM. And NIM is like a really interesting privacy project that's trying to bring, you know, privacy to crypto and, and beyond that. And now before we go into that, just briefly on our sponsor. So first of all, we have Tally. So Tally is a new uh, wallet for Web3 and DeFi that sees the wallet as a public good. So it's a bit like a community owned alternative to MetaMask. So it all, all, has all the features of MetaMask, but it's 100% open source and under a GPL V3 license. And it's, you know, it's fully user owned with all the projects flowing to the community. So the launch is coming soon and they just have a new version that you can check out, Tally Community Edition, before the DAO launches. And, you know, if you want to get involved, you should uh, try out Tally, join the Discord community. And uh, yeah, just go and check it out at tally.cash. And then the second sponsor, CowSwap. So, you know, DEXs are great, but the problem is they're vulnerable to things like MEV. You can get front run, have failed transactions, high gas costs. So CowSwap tackles this issue and offers a new kind of trading experience. So it's built by Gnosis, Frederike here, responsible partially. And it's a, so it's basically a meta DEX aggregator. So it, it aggregates different DEXs. So if you basically put your order in and then it matches the orders automatically and then if there's no matching order it just basically puts it uh, in a variety of underlying AMMs depending on where there's the best price. So yeah, um, give CowSwap a try. You can also have benefits like no gas fees paid for failed transactions and optimized transaction management for multi-sig and DAOs. So go over to cowswap.exchange and you can get started. So with that, let's go to our episode. Yeah, maybe just Harry and Jaya. Do you both want to introduce yourself a little bit? And you know, how did you end up in this working in this crypto space and working on NIM? So um, I could start. I'm uh, the uh, co-founder and CEO of NIM, and how we started is essentially, uh, you know, I was involved in uh, to a large extent. Uh, two very disparate things uh, for many years. I did my PhD in artificial intelligence at uh, the University of Edinburgh. And during my PhD and my work afterwards, uh, I realized what small amount of data can be used to de-anonymize someone, particularly metadata. Um, I became very concerned with this problem. I was uh, personally kind of under surveillance due to a uh, large amount of anarchist and climate change activism. And I ganged up with a bunch of friends of mine, including Jaya. We worked on uh, European Commission funded projects, including one to build a early version of NIM, which is a mixnet, which is a sort of uh, kind of system which can prevent nation state level surveillance. And then uh, when I saw various people, uh, particularly like I remember the blockstream raised very clearly and other raises, we said, well, look, we can actually uh, pivot. Uh, this mix that technology into a startup. So uh, Binance threw in, uh, then Polychain threw in, then A16Z threw in this year, and that's how we got where we are today. Tell us about uh, the things uh, that got you surveilled, Harry. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a pretty wild, uh, wild ride. Uh, I'm happy to talk about more of those things in detail, but why don't we have Jaya do a quick intro real, uh, to herself? Yeah, happily. Um, so my name is Jaya and I got involved uh, at NIM, um, joined as CSO a few months ago. Before then, I was working um, more on the kind of content, now more strategy side of things. And as Harry mentioned, um, yeah, we worked together quite a few years ago and we're kind of in and out of various social movements even longer time ago. Um, and so my let's say, first kind of encounter with the crypto uh, space was as part of um, one of these European Commission projects, um, namely one called Descent, which was where uh, I met a few people and read the Bitcoin white paper um, for the first time. And that was in uh, probably 2012, so pretty early on. 
And it struck me immediately as a super interesting proposition because, um, you know, I think both Harry and myself have been involved in lots of movements that have been looking at questions of decentralization and power and technology for quite a long time. Um, and here was a kind of new iteration of that that also started to look at the economics of some of these questions. Um, so that was super interesting to me. And um, I ended up writing a, a PhD that was a political analysis of Bitcoin and Ethereum, looking at some of these dynamics. Um, and then did a bit of work with Harry on Next Leap, uh, another European Commission project, which was the precursor to NIM. Um, and then I followed NIM's work uh, for a while before joining the project. And yeah, I'm very happy to, to be part of this very exciting project. How, how did you get in trouble with the man? Oh, well, that's pretty simple. It's very hard not to get in trouble with the man. Um, you know... Uh, it, it, how what what happened? This is this is all I think public record right now. Uh, is we were doing a lot of activism around what was considered a, a fringe issue at the time, which was climate change. Now it's somewhat socially acceptable to discuss it in public. In fact, there's even bizarre Netflix movies on it. Um, and we were trying to draw public attention and concern uh, to climate change uh, issues. And what happened is, uh, I had an undercover police officer called Mark Kennedy, which is now, uh, in the news assigned, uh, to me, uh, and, uh, their job was essentially make my, my life very difficult as, as an organizer, which they were very successful at doing. Uh, they, you know, the police even harassed my PhD advisor, came into my office at the university. I mean, it was pretty wild. I, there's a lot of, uh, at, at, at MIT and all sorts of other places. Um, and yeah, I'm still on a blacklist, so I, I have trouble flying. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the, the, the cop later revealed himself and the whole operation fell apart, but uh, that made me realize uh, how damaging, I think, surveillance and can be in privacy violations. So it was not only myself, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I got off quite light. Uh, it, being on a back blacklist is not really the end of the world, particularly if you run your own company. Um, but uh, a lot of my friends really had their lives utterly destroyed um, for years, if not longer. And I, I think, um, and the important thing to realize uh is that no matter what you're doing, so you may think that you're just sending Bitcoin around, you may think I'm just enjoying some free yields on a DeFi project, uh, you may think what you're doing is uh, completely innocent legal lobbying. Uh, you know, if you really anger uh, any of the kind of forces that be, be those corporate, uh, the undercover cop was paid by actually oil corporations for a bit, or a government, um, you know, at some point they're gonna wanna shut you down. Uh, and when they want to shut you down, they will. There is no law involved. They will do whatever it is they can uh, to surveil your communication and to uh, destroy your uh, relationships and to get you fired from your job and not maybe. And if you're in the Middle East, uh, as several friends of mine were, put in jail and tortured. And so it's uh, it killed. Uh, and so you know when you when you see the amount of devastation uh, that surveillance has caused, it seemed natural that we should have. Tech, I mean, also, to be honest, I worked with Tim Berners-Lee and we saw that all the policy-based approaches, the ending mass surveillance, did not exactly succeed. It's still very much, in fact, maybe even it was legalized after the Snowden leaks. So, so you know, it was an obvious move to sort of say, well, are there any technological uh, fixes? And there's no uh, simple technological fix, but is there any technological, let's say, self-defenses that someone can use against surveillance? And it was very clear that when you're up against nation state level adversaries, uh, as I was, um, current defenses aren't strong enough. And therefore I sat down with my old friend, this is, you know, 2012, uh, sat down with my old friend, George Denises, uh, who went on currently still at NIM, has had a sort of checkered past with the company, uh, who was working on Mixnets, which is a technology that predates Tor. And he was working actually with the Tor founders on an earlier Mixnet called MixMinion, which was probably the Mixnet used by Satoshi Nakamoto even to hide his identity when he launched the Bitcoin white paper. And I was discussing with George. I said, look, we should just revisit this and build a new Mixnet because I personally want to see this technology out there. And luckily, George, Anya, the rest of the NIM team designed, built, uh, first under nonprofit funding and now under uh, startup funding, a new mix that which we think is uh, kind of what we would call best of breed against very powerful global 
adversaries who can watch every bite coming in and out of a network. And it's not perfect. You know, it's not going to stop a lot of things that hurt me, good old fashioned uh, undercovers who, you know, whatever, come to your house. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're <laughs> mixed that can't stop that. But I do think it, it, it will be a, uh, a, a valuable tool in the future, uh, not just for activists, but for everyone. Because again, the main thing is when you get targeted, you don't think what you're doing is illegal. I definitely uh, didn't think I would be targeted, but nonetheless, it will happen to you. And that's why it's important to have these technologies built in by default and widely available to everyone. Like, I think there is something to, something really important to understand also about the difference between kind of surveillance as many people tend to think about it, where it's like, oh, someone, you know, the state doesn't like someone and then they start looking at what they're doing and they kind of like, you know, send undercovers or whatever to their house and so on. Um, there's a slight difference between kind of that, which is, I think, a, a common conception of, of surveillance and then what happens with mass surveillance and algorithmic surveillance, um, where in actual fact, the behavior of everybody is gathered and scraped together in order to then be analyzed and then surface who is, you know, doing something abnormal and who should the state actually be looking at. And so, and I, and I want to make that point, and I think it's very important to make that point because um, uh, so often, you know, when, when we talk about privacy and surveillance, people are like, oh, well, if I haven't done anything wrong, you know, why would the state come after me or so on and so forth. But when, I, when actually, you know, all of your digital activities online, you know, interact with everybody else's digital activities in a way that might harm others. So when you're being surveilled, it's not necessarily that it will harm you, but it will harm other people because you're part of setting a norm um, and thereby kind of like surfacing abnormal behavior or becoming a target um, in terms of, you know, everything from kind of credit rating to, to terrorism lists. So, you know, what we're talking about here is really like what mass surveillance does at a kind of larger scale. Um, and at a kind of at the scale of society more generally and, you know, how that curbs the, the freedoms of society more generally. Yeah, like one, uh, we, we did this end of year review episodes a few weeks ago. And uh, one of the things like I, I mentioned there, like I've been thinking a, bit, a little bit about. So if, if you if you think of like crypto as this you know technology that, you know, threatens the, you know, existing powers you know like the nation states the uh, banks and and then if you, if you want to kind of suppress that right as a nation state then like how, how how would you do that i mean it seems like one thing is if you look at the tax rules around crypto it's like basically very confusing and nebulous and unclear for the most part and then i think anyone who's now going to do like any DeFi. NFT stuff at scale is basically going to be like unable to, I think, file their taxes properly, right? Because it's just super hard. So I, th I think that is actually, you know, in, in a way, then it, it, it will give this great leverage, right? Because if you, if you basically, if everyone by default becomes like someone who you can potentially pin for because like, oh, you did this thing at that point and like, was it properly filed? Well, no. So that like, that's one, one way I, I could see this becoming like a big topic at some point. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I could go quickly on that. I mean, so we have uh, at NIM, because we're a surveillance company, a company that hopes to fight surveillance, that we, uh, we realize that there's a lot of legal issues. Actually, uh, ends up running a mixed net or VPN or Torlex -like system is perfectly legal. But what is definitely not clear, what's definitely gray zone, is a lot of money transfers, right? So you have giant list of countries and people which are on America's blacklist that's the OFAC list uh, you've got politically exposed persons uh, you have also different lists per country different rules per country and blockchain technology uh, it has two issues that make it a gold mine for mass surveillance uh, one is everything's over the internet so everything's naturally cross-jurisdictional uh, and second, everyone self-surveils by putting all your transactions on a blockchain so we can prove that they happen. And that blockchain is a very useful uh, uh, source of data. And then combine that with mass surveillance, when, which is where most of the data of any kind is being sent, even off-chain data, as I say, lightning uh, transactions and whatnot. Um, and, and you have an incredible source of data for uh, any kind of uh, any kind of legal prosecution, and you got to remember, you often sometimes 
you know, you may not be prosecuted for what you think you're going to be prosecuted for. It should be remembered, for example, that, you know, they couldn't take Al Capone out for being part of the mafia, but I think they got him on taxes, if I remember correctly. You know, and that's what you call parallel construction argument. Those are actually, we believe, uh, quite common. There's some evidence our, our NIMS lawyer has actually uh, used to pursue some of those cases around. He, he brought the first cases up to the U.S. court about mass surveillance uh, being used for uh, parallel construction arguments in the case of Guantanamo detainees, right? So they'll, they'll grab some random, you know, shepherd from Afghanistan or something and say, hey, you're a part of Al-Qaeda. And of course, he was actually just a shepherd, but they could kind of go through everyone's phone records and a cousin of a cousin of his brother's friends somehow communicate to someone who was on a blacklist. And that can happen to anyone, not just uh, that can happen in the United States, that can happen anywhere, anytime. And I think these kinds of, uh, going off what Jai said, these mass surveillance combined with blockchain com technology, combined with lack of legal certainty and regulatory uncertainty, are a uh, are, are gold mine for repression. And I honestly, look, I'm an American. I used to be at MIT. I worked with Gary. I don't think that they are going to clarify these rules because why would you? If you clarify the rules about mass surveillance, you clarify the rules about cryptocurrencies, uh, then you, you lose the ability to selectively prosecute people you don't like. And what nation state in their right mind would give that up? I sure wouldn't. I mean... And um, so I, I think the situation is actually going to get worse. I feel like we're actually in maybe a calm before the storm, particularly in terms of DeFi, where I think uh, the U.S. government has kind of said, we don't care how many dumb foundations you have or weird uh, DAOs or you think you're anonymous. We're going to pierce all, through all of that and we're going to make sure uh, all the developers get adequately uh, punished. Um, and that's uh, that's a, a, a so we're entering a, a possibly really dangerous period in history for cryptocurrency, uh, probably the most dangerous. And that's why I think technology like NIM is really needed. So, Jaya, I read your I read a blog post uh, penned by you uh, in which you cite the cypherpunk manifesto um, in that um, transparency is for for the powerful um privacy is for the rest of us. So basically the, the second part kind of become super clear um, in the context of what you and Harry just talked about. Um, can you talk about the first part, transparency for the powerful, and how is how, how should we, basically, what kind of transparency do we talk about here, and uh, who should count as powerful? Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question. Like, it's it's relatively easy to answer that question when we're talking about kind of traditional institutional um, and governance frameworks, where you have a kind of clear division between a public and a private sector, right? Where it's like, okay, people who hold uh, you know public office, people who make decisions that affect like broad uh, uh, parts of the population, they need to be held accountable for those decisions and for the actions that they're taking, right? Um, whether that's in public office or whether they work for a big company or, you know, whatever. So it's like that's it's a pretty kind of easy uh, topic to explain when we have kind of relatively clear um, power structures that are institutionalized. Um, what I wrote that blog post about, however, was how to address that question when it comes to decentralized networks. Um, and what I've found is that many times people's understanding of um, surveillance and privacy tends to be very crude. So they tend to think like either, you know, we have privacy and then everything is private and anybody can do whatever they want. Um, or we have like complete surveillance, right? Um, when in actual fact, that's not how uh, infrastructures and architectures actually work. Um, and that's not really how we would want them to work because, you know, if there is a kind of like blanket privacy, then, you know, you, you very quickly tend to see uh, power grabs that then remain invisible and people who have inordinate decision-making power that affect other people and that can no longer be held accountable. So how do you deal with that in supposedly decentralized um, infrastructures and, and architectures? Um, and so here, the kind of argument that I put forward in that blog post is, you know, who is the powerful in this in this case when we're talking about a decentralized network? Um, well, it is, the, it is the protocol and the network itself, right? The, or the technical organization of the network. And so therefore, you know, people that are running Running uh, core parts of that infrastructure need to be able to, you know, need to be known and need to be able to help be held accountable. And so in our case, we're talking about um, node runners. And this, this extends a little bit further. And I don't mean node runners in terms of the private people that, you know, behind running the nodes, but I'm talking about the actual nodes themselves. So, and this extends to also questions of information security. So, 
Um, I've been having long conversations with Claudia Diaz, our chief scientist at NIM, um, who designs a lot of the uh, both the kind of uh, token economics and the uh, the security side of the infrastructure and of the mixnet. And she uh, talks about this a lot too. And she she wrote a paper um, that was looking at uh, how to verify the location of nodes. Um, and you know we were very quickly conscious of the fact that like for 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 a lot of people who think about you know, privacy and surveillance, you know, the idea of being able to verify the IP address and the, or the exact kind of geolocation of a node sounds like, you know, sounds like surveillance. It sounds like a kind of like, a, you know, we're, 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 we're spying on the whole network or whatever. But actually, like when you think about it in this, in this kind of term, um, we need to know the location of the nodes in order to understand that the network is sufficiently decentralized across geographies in order to be able to assess the security parameters of the mixed net and know that nodes are not colluding, right? Um, and, uh, and we need to do that in order to secure the privacy of the end user. And so here are the kind of, you know, I hope that I'm making myself clear that fundamentally it's a, it's a kind of extension of the original cypherpunk saying of transparency for the powerful privacy for the rest of us, but an extension of that into a context of where we, where we're operating with decentralized networks. Yeah. I'll just add a, a little, I'll jump in here really quickly. I mean, it's very important to remember that, the purpose of NIM is to provision anonymous communication and privacy to end users. That's that's the goal. And a lot of uh, our goal is not to make uh, um, node runners themselves, mix nodes, hide their IP address. They're doing the work that's rewarded to help. Uh, we can maybe discuss what a mix net is uh, soon uh, to help users get 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 uh get privacy and the people that have the power these networks and we're seeing this you know DAOs with developers increased transparency and governance uh protocol changes and upgrades these are all things that you know i'm very interested in a little bit skeptical in some DAOs, but overall i think the the mood that at least that the thought the heart is in the right place these are things which are necessary in order to build a real privacy enhancing network so let's take the example of tor or a lot of other networks where, you know, you have a lot of users in the U.S., all the node runners are in Germany. So you're just shuffling packets between the U.S. and Germany, then back to the U.S. where all of Silicon Valley is. Uh, that's not very, that's not very great. Wouldn't it be wonderful or better if we could guarantee that your, for example, uh, as was done in early versions of WikiLeaks, that uh your packets went through multiple jurisdictions. That would be great, but we can't do that unless we know, we don't want to know the identity of the node operators, but we can't do that unless we know where their actual IP address is and where their machine is. So, you know, we could sort of say, we could guarantee uh, that, for example, you know, a, 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 a piece of traffic that's going, that's very important, goes through not just Germany and the US, but also, for example, could go through Iceland or could go through Switzerland. And uh, that's really important to do in a very, in a very practical sense. Uh, likewise, we also need transparency and we need thing, uh, other technology that increases transparency like reproducible builds in order that users can trust our technology and that if I get... Uh, you know, rubber hose attack, I get kidnapped, Jaya gets kidnapped, our, one of our developers goes goes rogue and decides to put a backdoor in, because you guys out there, the end users can catch it. That's, again, another good reason uh, to push open source and to make sure that no matter what happens, the network is fully functional uh, and there's no dependencies on the team or uh, and we have enough technical safeguards that no group of uh, node runners can control and corrupt the network. Maybe this is like a little bit of a detour, but just something that came up that was like, I thought it was very interesting. So there's this guy, I don't know if you remember him, but it is James D'Angelo. He made this like really fantastic Bitcoin videos, like a long, long time ago, like eight years ago or something, seven years ago. But I remember one of the things that he kind of, he, he then sort of stopped working on Bitcoin and he started this research basically on like transparency and his argument uh, that he was making was that actually transparency was something that was used to corrupt a lot like US politics, right? Where you basically have like, you know, in the Senate or in the Congress, you know, people would like vote a certain way and then you'd have all of these organizations who'd be like, okay, no, we need to you know, these interest groups who then would basically give donations based on like some voting records. 
And we're basically able to like use that data effectively to sort of corrupt that process. I'm, I'm curious if you have any like thoughts on this idea. I mean, I don't know the specifics of that story, um, but I do think that there is a lot that still needs to, that needs to be worked out in terms of how the dynamics around transparency and privacy operate, especially going forward into the kind of Web3 space. Um, Harry kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Like there is some, uh, let's say, there is some kind of, you know, industry standards that have kind, that have kind of emerged around this stuff. So like it's fairly kind of... Uh, commonly agreed upon that, you know, code needs to be transparent, right? Open source is kind of like, is pretty important. People understand the security reasons for that. Um, and there's also kind of accountability reasons for that, right? It's like, how is this thing actually, op you know, how, how does this thing, how, you know, what does the code look like of this, you know, co you know key infrastructure that I'm actually depending on? Um, so there's certain kinds of, let's say, norms and standards and, and um, uh, ways of doing things that that are emerging in and around the Web3 space. But on the question of kind of transparent ledgers and on, um, you know, node operators and all this kind of stuff, there's a lot of like murky stuff that hasn't quite been worked out yet. You know, where is the line between surveillance and, and privacy? Um, where is the line between surveillance and accountability? Um, you know, it's kind of, this is stuff that, that needs to be really kind of thought through in, in some detail. And I think this, this coming... I think this coming year, I mean, with the kind of like boom of Web3 that we've been seeing recently, I think with this coming year, we're going to see privacy really become kind of one of the core uh, parts of the conversation, one of the kind of core topics in, in the debate. And back to the government issue, I mean, I, I find it hilarious. So I'm visiting the United States uh, and all of my uh, friends here in the uh, wonderful world of Bitcoin and blockchain technologies are really talking about how they really are going to have to lobby the U.S. government. And uh, it, I, you know, I, 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 we're not going to touch the U.S. That's our NIM doesn't touch the U.S. That's one of our primary objectives, actually, in existence. Um, however, you know, I said, well, how are you going to lobby the U.S. government? And they said, oh, we're just going to like, you know, pay campaign donations to. A group of random senators and uh, and representatives. I was like, wow. And I was discussing this actually with my friends uh, in the Middle East. Uh, they said, you know, in the Middle East, the U.S. media would just call that corruption. Uh, you know, they they well, you you don't you know if you if I say, hey, would it be great if you passed this law? Here's fifty k, uh, and this law saves me millions or you know half billions of dollars. That that's that's corruption. That's not really a. Uh, I mean, lobbying is a very nice sounding word, but that's not. And I, I honestly don't think, I mean, maybe I, I've lived in Europe too long, but I don't think that happens in Europe, at least not to the same extent I see it in the U.S. Jaya can remind me, but I, I've never heard of this kind of lobbying, at least in, in Switzerland or France, which is where I've primarily been. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Um but it's normalized in the U.S. and the U.S. has some virtue signaling around it. Would say, oh, it's just lobbying, da da da. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, to be honest, if I were a U.S. blockchain company, I would be very worried. I'd be doing it too. Uh, but that being said, uh, the fact that governments themselves can be so heavily influenced by uh, existing wealthy powers, and of course, obviously, the traditional banking sector is probably one of the most wealthiest. Uh, 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 powers in imaginable, uh, I think is think bodes very poorly for the future of the United States uh, in general. I don't see a difference uh, between the U.S. government uh, how they deal with lobbying corruption in uh, what they would call uh, uh, some third world, third rate government. I think it's basically the same. Um, and, uh, I, I hope at some point the U S government actually gets its act together and purges all this corruption out of the system. As a, as a European, I, I can assure you similar things happen in Europe. Um, and I mean, usually it's not $50,000 against a piece of legislations, le legislation, but it's, um, it's mostly, um, a little bit more, um, well, less overt. Uh, so basically it's kind of like ingratiating yourself and basically um, giving people talking points so they can look knowledgeable and so on. And But it absolutely happens here. I think it happens everywhere in the world. Um, but uh, I mean, <clears throat> zooming out a bit again, it seems there is a very dedicated group of people who are whose aim it is 
um, to protect our privacy online. Um, but to me, this actually starkly contrasts with what probably 98% of internet users actually act like, right? So almost everyone doesn't give a second thought to the data trail they leave behind on the internet. So do you think that this is a um, fringe movement, kind of like uh, the climate <laughs> change activism you were involved in in the past that's going to make it to the mainstream? Or do you think this is something, do you think people will start to care that they give their data to Google and Facebook and um Uh, you know, are the other large corporations that mine it? Um, or do you think this will have to, th this this will stay um, the, this will stay like a pet peeve for a, a small vocal group of privacy defenders? Um, I'm happy to take this, Harry. So I think we can see from the downloads of Signal app last year that like people absolutely do care. Um, the problem is not whether people care. The problem is that it's actually really difficult to defend your privacy online as an individual user in the current uh, infrastructure setup. And so what NIM, you know, aims to do is to really kind of protect uh, communications at the network layer, right? So we're not kind of like going to provide yet another tool to a user who feels a little bit paranoid to try and kind of patch up a leaking system. It's really to try and kind of address some of the problems at the kind of deep infrastructure layer. So that's the kind of, you know, that's how NIM positions um, ourselves and which also means that, you know, we would... We would sit, you know, the mixed net would sit under applications like Signal and other kind of privacy um, applications. Um, I do not think that privacy is going to remain a pet peeve. I think actually it's going to be one of the main topics going forward in the next year and for some um, really important reasons. Uh, first of all, you know, the COVID pandemic has been going on for, for a couple of years now, um, which means that pretty much every single activity that we do as humans currently now takes place via digital infrastructures. Um, and that includes, you know, uh, school, shopping, um, you know, all the way through to probably sex and, and everything in between, right? So um, what that means is that, you know, we actually are more exposed to surveillance than we have ever been before. And I think that's going to start to dawn on people. Um, so that's kind of on the, on the bigger scale. And then I think some of the kind of, as I mentioned earlier, I think some of the privacy issues with Web3 are really going to start to come to the foreground. Um, we've seen people like Moxie already write um, posts about this. Um, and, you know, there's more and more debates in the Web3 space around privacy. And then, uh, and then finally also, you know, payments, you know, um, cash is disappearing, almost all payments are becoming digital. Um, at, so the question of kind of economic and financial surveillance is going to start to become more and more uh, apparent to people as well as they start to see, you know, everything from their credit records to, you know, who knows what, you know, start to be affected by um, economic surveillance. And it's something that, you know, we can even talk about this across different types of um, Uh, bodies, right? So there, one thing is like whether the individual cares, and I think the individual absolutely d does care. You can see that in the amount of Netflix TV series that are coming out about um, Facebook and various other kind of big tech uh, surveillance driven platforms. Um, but I think, you know, uh, also more importantly, companies and organizations are really going to start to care, um, you know, uh, corporate surveillance and so on. Um, and all the way through to, to governments, you know, like uh, the conundrum that, that governments have is basically like how to balance, you know, the, you know, keeping, you know, national communication infrastructure secure, but then governments are always trying to sneak in a back door, which actually like fucks up their security anyway. Um, and so, you know, what we really need is a solution that cuts across all these diverse actors and that do not have that kind of like the problem of, of having some kind of inherent interest in surveilling others, which is the problem of governments and the problem of corporations. Um, and that's why NIM is decentralized. And that's why, you know, NIM op is trying to operate at the infrastructure layer, layer rather than just um, offering yet another patch to a, to a leaking system for, for an end user. So let's talk about NIM. So let's talk about the infrastructure that you guys provide. Um, can you maybe um, describe in a nutshell what NIM sets out to do and how it sets out to do that? And then we can kind of delve deeper into the details. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll, we could uh, essentially what, imagine that you have an entity, an adversary, an enemy, 
that is watching your every move. It's a bit like that 80s song, right? Uh, every move you make on the internet. They're watching every packet that comes in and out of the network. How would you defend against that? So you could say, oh, don't worry, we'll just use the VPN. But, you know, if the adversary can watch all the packets coming in the VPN and all the packets coming out the VPN, so they essentially get a kind of fingerprint, not just of the IP address, but the timing and the volume, the kind of pattern of those packets. So VPNs don't work. Uh, and, you know, Tor is much, much better than VPN, but you can kind of run the same attack on Tor. You can say, look at all the packets coming in the Tor entry node, look at all the packets coming out the exit node, and we can do some machine learning on those and, and figure out which stream of packets is coming from which user. So then the question is, how would you defend against someone watch, who's watching all your packets and is watching everyone you might be talking to's packets? How would you defend against such a powerful enemy? And the answer is actually pretty intuitive, which is you have, just like Tor, you have nodes in between. You give your packets to someone else. Other people give those packets to someone else. That person, if you imagine the packets are like a deck of cards, they mix the packets up. That's why it's called a mix net. Uh, you know, you could imagine it like shuffling a deck of cards if you're a mathematician, a random permutation. Uh, and then they release those packets, in our case, using a statistical process called a Poisson process. Other people have different takes on it. And those, pack those packets are then mixed up. So they're not coming in and out the node in the same order. Then they go to other nodes and they continue to mix those packets up. And after a little bit of mixing, even an adversary which is watching the entire network with this God's eye view, can't figure out who sent what packet to what person. And so that is honestly currently the most scalable uh, defense uh, against mass surveillance we have today. And that's what NIM is. NIM is a mixed net. It's composed of servers, nodes, which mix packets on behalf of users. Now, the big question with mixed nets and mixed nets are not new. They predate Bitcoin. Adam Back was commercializing them with zero knowledge systems before uh, he founded Blockstream. Um, uh, cypherpunks probably uh, were using <laughs> mix, uh, early mixed nets like Mixmaster and Mixit Minion to disguise their email. So they've been around a while. But the problem uh, that afflicts mixed nets is where do you get. Uh, all these people to run, how do you get all these people to run nodes? That's a really good question because uh, you're assuming a decentralized network. Uh, the security and the privacy is dependent on having multiple independent parties uh, use the uh, running these nodes. And so obviously we can take the lessons that we've learned from Bitcoin and apply those to mixed networking. We can say, well, can we reward uh, mixed networks using a kind of reputation token? To, to say, look, this mix node is really doing its job mixing. This other guy, he's just dropping all of his packets. Uh, and that's what NIM does. So NIM takes a, a mixed network design, particular design called Lupix, uh, built by George and Anya, who are both now at NIM. And uh, we improve upon it. And one way we improve upon it is we add an incentive layer on top, and a repu which is built on our essentially a reputation tracking mechanism. And that is the provision... Uh, this kind of privacy that mixnets uh, mixnets give you, with also high quality of service, and the mixnets kind of fast and reliable, and people that can't run mixnodes very well eventually carry less and less traffic over time, and those that uh, do mix and uh, traffic uh, correctly and fast uh, get more and more rewards. And we think that's uh, we think this is actually quite a large breakthrough. This system has not quite been developed before, and uh, although there's some other things, options in the space, and uh, we really look forward to launching it at mainnet pretty soon. So can you also talk a little bit about, you know, like the use cases, like how, like once name is live and functions well, like what are some of the ways that you see people interacting and using, interacting with and using them? I mean, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have to know about it because your wallet for example, your you know Monero wallet, your Zcash wallet, your Bitcoin wallet, your liquid Bitcoin wallet, probably for some privacy on chain, uh, would know about NIM and would just run NIM automatically, just as when you download Tor browser, you're using Tor automatically. Now, obviously, uh, that's not the case right now, uh, but we are going to build infrastructure such that people can easily plug in. Currently, if you're a power user, NIM uses the same kind of SOX5 interface as Tor. You can just go into Keybase or Firefox and kind of plug in, you can start a NIM client on your machine and plug that 
local gateway IPs address into your configuration. You can run apps through NIM through the testnet right now. In the future, uh, we'd like to see a number of uh, applications actually natively integrate NIM. Uh, I've discussed it with Moxie from Signal. Of course, he's very skeptical in the decentralization aspects. Uh, you know, we could imagine, but I think instant messaging is a great use case for NIM. Uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, pre uh, there's been previous work which seems to point to the fact that things where a few packets being dropped are kind of okay would also be good for mixed nets. So this would include voice and audio. Uh, voice over the internet is pretty good. Maybe even video over the internet, things that can buffer. Uh, things, that, uh, things that aren't very good for NIM is probably web browsing. Uh, I think Tor is probably the best option you have right now. I don't really see that changing uh, particularly anytime, particularly soon. Uh, so I use Tor every day and, and, and Tor is more optimized for things like web browsing where you have large amounts of pockets, uh, packets, sorry, uh, being streamed through in a synchronous manner. And MixNet's because this mixing process, it's a little bit more latency and, the, and the, it's better for apps that have a more asynchronous message based approach to traffic. So hopefully this stuff's just built in by default. Uh, we'll let users use it and add it to apps as they see fit, just as they can currently do with Tor. And we eventually hope that privacy enhanced apps take network privacy seriously. Currently to our knowledge, almost no one does except Tor and that they build uh, them directly into their applications. So as I understand it, there are two key improvements here, right? So basically one um, is the fact that um, every package is independently routed and thus reordered, kind of making it harder to uh, to figure out that they kind of belong together. And the other thing is um, uh, that um, there's an incentive layer added, right? We There's one counterintuitive point insofar as that we allow you to add fake traffic as well. So let's say none of people use the network, you still want your packets to be anonymous. Uh, we can basically add a fake cover dummy, whatever you want to call it, traffic into the system to guarantee certain levels of anonymity, even if there's not enough users. Now, the great thing with NIM uh, is thanks to the way that we built our network statistically, the more people that use a network, counterintuitively, the faster the network gets and the less cover traffic you need. If you want to be anonymous, there's a giant crowd of people using the network, then you don't need that much cover traffic. You can actually mix those packets for less amount of time uh, while maintaining the same amount of privacy. That's not the case. Uh, so we kind of, with blockchain systems, we're essentially, the way I think about blockchain systems, it's kind of an auction for a, a, a finite amount of, 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 of uh, a block space. So we kind of scale like web servers, you know, more traffic comes in, Great, we can add more mixed nodes, and I'll let uh, Jaya explain the incentive system here in a second. But I do want to point out that it's not just independently routing and mixing the packets, it's also adding fake traffic and balancing that fake traffic and the amount of mixing so we can achieve scalability and high quality of service. Jaya, do you want to just take over on the incentive stuff real quick? Um, yeah, sure. I'm just trying to kind of think, looping back on F uh, Frederica's um, question on like the improvements, I guess, um, yeah, we've been kind of like laying out a lot of the kind of like technical details, but I wanted to kind of make it a, a little bit, maybe a bit more clear for kind of non-technical audiences, um, what the improvement really is here. Um, so, you know, it's almost like you got to think of kind of like, you know, the, the stack in layers. And so where you might have a wallet or a messaging application and so on that might have kind of like end to end encryption. So, you know, we're seeing this a lot. And like also to speak to your earlier question of like whether people actually care, you know, once you start seeing like what's up, try to start to advertise that they're privacy friendly, they have end to end to -end encryption and so on. Then you know that, OK, this is something that people are aware of. Privacy is something that actually people care about. But what's important to understand is that even when the message is, is encrypted, um, the actual the actual metadata and the patterns of communications are still visible. And that can actually reveal a lot more than people normally think. So it can reveal, you know, where you're, you know, where you're located, um, who you're speaking to, how often you're speaking to them, what time of the day, which can reveal a lot about your relationship to that person. So say you're sending a message to, to one person at 11 o'clock at night every single day, then that's a very different type of relationship than if you're sending a message to someone, you know, um, at 10 in the morning or whatever. So it's like there's a lot of uh, important information that um, is revealed uh, and that is, in fact, as uh, Claudia Diaz also likes to say, is in fact a lot more kind of machine readable 
um, that gets revealed, you know, rather than the content of the message. And so what NIM does is it adds that kind of, you know, a deeper layer of protection to communications that does not allow for um, uh, surveillance of the patterns of communication and the metadata of communication. So that's what the that's the kind of major improvement to existing um, private messaging apps or or uh, wallets and, and so on. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you said that um, NIM can be used as a service for all kinds of applications, right? So basically blockchain and non-blockchain based. So can you maybe um, go into how NIM works together with other other applications? So basically what's the interface like? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I, I kind of leaned towards that earlier. You know, NIM was originally not built with blockchain applications in mind. It was built... Uh, with people that wanted, you know, including European governments, that wanted to avoid NSA surveillance in mind. Um, and so the way you kind of think about it, just as any application can run over VPN, and if you're clever enough, any application can run over Tor, uh, any application, internet application, can have its packets mixed uh, by NIM. Any application can run over NIM. Uh, in detail, how that works is that just like Tor, uh, or a VPN, you have to install a local client. That client has the library that kind of starts that process out for you that connects to the mixed net. That application, your application that you want to use them has to somehow talk to that library. Uh, currently, there's a standardized protocol that's also used by VPNs and Tor called SOX5, and we just support that protocol at the box. So in a lot of applications, there's a, a way to kind of natively run your traffic through SOX5 proxies, and that's so things that were built without NIM, even knowing about NIM, again, Keybase, Firefox, and these uh, these sort of apps come to mind, can easily plug into NIM today, which is quite nice. So, you know, it's not a, it's not just a dream in a white paper. It's actually a real working code, thanks to our excellent dev team who's been working around the clock for three years on this. And so that being said, there's nothing to prevent an application developer from what we call natively binding to NIM. And so that means they can actually just sort of add that add that library into their application, bundle it with their application so you don't even think about it when you uh, when you install uh, when you install uh, that application. And you know in order because we imagine a quite diverse number of applications wanting network level privacy, there's you know not just blockchain apps but everyone, we've also built in a, a truly diverse uh, diverse amount of ways to pay for them. Uh, so nothing is free in this world, but we try to make NIM as free as possible and allow people to be very flexible. So, for example, you know, no one's going to pay for instant messaging. That's crazy. I definitely want it. Uh, but we can imagine that instant messaging applications, uh, you know, Telegram, Signal and whatnot that are interested in NIM uh, can just sort of, you know, use it in bulk for all of their users. And they essentially uh, just kind of purchase some bandwidth on NIM. Uh, in bulk for all their users at once, and then the use for the user, it's just free. Uh, people that use Bitcoin, uh, power users, uh, might want to, for example, you know, whenever you use Bitcoin, you have a little transaction fee. Uh, you can imagine a, a sort of similar model being approached with NIM, where you, you pay a little privacy fee uh, to keep your network level data private. And, you know, honestly, we've built a very open ended system in this regard uh, so that. Not only can many different apps plug into NIM in very different ways, including native bindings and proxy bindings and standardized bindings. So it's really up to the developer, the, even the power user, how they want to plug into NIM. Um, we've also made it super uh, easy for people to pay, to NIM, pay for NIM in whatever way they want. So I don't want people to have to do something sketchy with an exchange just to use them. I think that's crazy, and that's blocking a lot of quote-unquote Web3 projects. If I'm using NIM with a Bitcoin wallet, I want to pay for NIM using just a little bit of Bitcoin and you know maybe an API call. I think that's how most people who use Bitcoin wallets, for example, will interact with NIM. Let's talk about the business side um, in a little bit. Um, I, I'm still not 100% sure on how it works. So maybe if I give an example. So basically say um, I have um, 500 packet, uh, packets that I want to send to Brian, right? So basically, um, so I would, um, whom would I, so basically would my application that I wanted to send this out of already kind of, distribute this to different nodes or do I have to send it to an initial node first and they kind of split it up or um, how, how, because if I, if I have to send everything to an initial node um, then it's it's 
immediately clear that all of those come from me, right? So at least that node would know. And if you surveil all traffic, um, you could also know. Yeah, right? so how NIM works is that I download some client software. It's important when you send traffic through NIM that each packet is encrypted in the same size and looks just like every other packet. Otherwise, you could identify them. So these packets are essentially uh, your whatever, let's say your 500 packets. They're all made into, let's say, let's say they're made into a thousand Sphinx packets, which is this format that we use to make all the packets identical. That's done locally. That's done on your machine by a client of what's called the NIM client. Now, the NIM client then wants to talk to the NIM mix network. Now, there's two ways to do that. Uh, the first hop in the network, which is obviously the most vulnerable, is called the gateway. So you could go to public gateway, which could be just like a VPN provider. Could be the app could have the gateway built in. Or if you're pretty paranoid, you don't want anyone to know your your IP. You can run your own gateway. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi or whatever in your house on your you know on your machine, your desktop machine. Probably not something you want to turn on an awful lot. And those packets go to the first hop into the network, which is called the gateway. Uh, that gateway then asks a blockchain, a directory authority system, for where's all the mix nodes? Uh, it, you know, and that gi it's given to the client software. The client software, each time it's building the packet, also builds an independent path for that packet through the network. And that packet, that path is not revealed. It's Encrypt in such a way that it only the next hop, just like Tor, is revealed at every hop. So you can imagine you have 500 packets, you build a thousand Sphinx packets. Inside of each Sphinx packet is a encrypted route. Those packets are then shipped with some sort of timing delay, which is again statistically chosen via a fair process, uh, to a gateway that then ships it to the next hop in the path. And that hop is to a mix node and it goes through one mix node, goes through two mix nodes, currently goes through three mix nodes, and then it comes out. And at the last hop, because again, you told the packets when you were making them where they're going, they know where they're going. It's just the people that can view them can't see where they're going. Uh, the last hop kind of just like in a taking the peels off an of onion and onion encryption takes that final layer of encryption off. It sees the address the IP address of where that packet uh, should be going. That packet sent to the gateway or the exit uh, node, you can think of it, that goes to that application or Bob or whoever it is you're sending the packet to. So again, nodes are bundled locally. They're all made identical. They're given their path locally in an unbiasable and fair way using verifiable random functions, other kind of cool crypto sent through the network. When they go through the network, the mix nodes themselves never, they only know, they don't know who sent it. They don't know where it's going. They only see the hop it came from, the next hop. That's why you go through three mix nodes. And that's why you go through five hops in general. So you have a uh, local client, since the gateway, three mix nodes, final gateway, then to Bob or whoever your application is at the end. And you think this would be very slow, but actually you can get good anonymy by just a few seconds. Uh, up to, you know, definitely minutes, uh, but also seconds through this process. This process can be done pretty quickly thanks to the wonders of high-speed modern cryptography. Is that more clear? That's a bit more detail than I was expecting to give on a, on a, on a podcast, but yeah, okay, great. So just one, one question here, like, um, cause you, you're basically like mixing up the order potentially right now. It, I think if you send something like a crypto transaction, like, okay, this makes like, obviously it makes sense to me, but I wonder you know, like, are there particular types? I mean, you mentioned before, I think like web browsing is something that wouldn't, wouldn't work well. Is that correct? Or like, you know, what are the types of application that like this works for? And like, what are the things that are basically like, this isn't uh, suitable for? A lot of people talk about NIM versus Tor, but I do think, you know, there are certain applications where mixed nets add too much latency and shipping packets in and out of order don't really make sense. So things like web browsing, for example, I think Tor is a great, uh, solution for web browsing. Um, however, you have to remember that this gateway essentially is taking the Sphinx packets in, buffering them and reassembling them. So even if the packets come in and out of order, you know, you're seeing enough packets through, they kind of get buffered and decrypted and sent to the client. That Sorry, that's actually done on the client, not the gateway. And that, that's, uh, that makes NIM suitable for certain kinds of applications 
cryptocurrency, as you mentioned earlier, instant messaging, but also things that you that that where it's okay for things to be a bit slow and to buffer or for occasional packets to get lost. I can do an audio or video call with you and some packets can get dropped. Uh, you lose some of the quality, but you can still do the call. And I think mixed nets would work for that. Um, also, you know, I may be uploading or downloading a giant file. Obviously, it seems going to be a little bit slower to use it with a mixed net. But again, I might not need to upload and download that file in a few seconds. I can wait a few minutes for that file to be chunked up and sent through a mixed net. Uh, that being said, uh, web browsing really is the hard problem. And I think for the foreseeable future, uh, it will uh, Tor will be better for web browsing. It's not theoretically impossible to send web browsing traffic through a mixed net. In fact, we have uh, we've done it. You can we have instructions on how to do it on our website if you're interested in doing it with Firefox. It's just that it's it's kind of slow and it's not I think the ideal it's not an ideal mechanism. Uh, one thing to note with them, which is sort of interesting, I actually forgot to mention this earlier, is that different applications will have different kind of there's kind of a trade off between how fast you want to go and how anonymous you want to be. And we actually let the user and the application choose that level. Um, we'll have some defaults we enforce, but you know, you can say, I don't really care about that. This is like a, uh, this is a super private Bitcoin transaction. So I want this to take, like, I'm okay if it takes like a day to go through, cause it's really important that remains private and we can support that, but we can also sort of say, Hey, I'm just, I want some privacy, but I'm also would like to do an audio or video call with Epicenter. And this isn't super, you know, it's going to be public. So it's not super important that I keep this 100% anonymous. And we also will support that uh, kind of application as well. But I think what's also, uh, and what's fun about that point is that those different applications, you know, all of them together in the same mix net actually enhances the security of each other because of the timing obfuscation. So it's, you know, the multiple different types of um, application use is actually to the benefit of everyone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, ca can we talk about the incentivization that goes on top? So basically, if you if you look at traditional um, privacy um, systems like Tor, um, as far as I understand, that that the tour is um, is donation based, and uh, Nim kind of has this inbuilt um, incentivization layer, right? So basically, there's a token and everything. Um, can you explain how that works? Um, yes, I'm, I'll be happy to explain how that works. Uh, yeah, so we have a utility token in NIM, which is called NIM. Um, and at a very basic level, um, uh, the system is designed to incentivize mix nodes to do the work of mixing data packets. And not only to do the work, but to do it well. Um, so the intention is to incentivize good quality of service rather than just um, mixing. So the way that that happens is that um, the, you know, the system is kind of like quite kind of uniquely uh, democratic in a sense, um, because the performance of each mix node is measured in the reputation, in the community reputation. Um, so how that works is that anybody who holds NIM tokens can actually delegate stake to a mix node um, that they believe is going to, are going to perform good work, uh, good work of mixing. And if they do perform good work of mixing, that mix node will get rewarded in NIM. Um, and then the people who have delegated to that mix node will receive a, re a share of that reward. Um, so the way that the incentives works in this case then is that people who hold NIM are incentivized to delegate to nodes that perform well. Um, nodes are incentivized to perform well because then they'll receive more delegations. And the more delegations that they receive, the more likely they are to be um, uh, selected to continue doing the mixing for the network. So um, the kind of that's a kind of like brief sketch, the brief kind of overview of the reward system. Um, but what's nice about it is that you know you can have different levels of um, expertise come in here. You know where those running nodes might have you know a bit more kind of expertise in how to kind of set up a, a well functioning node. Um, but in actual fact, anybody who holds NIM tokens can participate in um, ensuring that the network operates well. And and this is uh, right. This is like a Cosmos SDK network, right? Is my understanding. No. So is uh, does it mean basically like all of the mix node operators are also validators of the proof of stake network, or are these like decoupled functions? So these are decoupled functions. So essentially, you have to kind of think about it as like. Um, almost almost two separate systems. I mean, that are very integrated, but um, kind of two separate systems. So the mixnet with the mixed nodes, you know, operate 
the Mixnet. Um, and, uh, and then separately to that, you know, and the Mixnet makes use of a Cosmos blockchain, um, which is then operated by a, a set of validators. Um, the set of validators currently is a permission set, but we're going to be depermissioning later this year. Um, and it's a permission set because it is a, a core aspect of the infrastructure. So we're trying to kind of like match that to, to real skin in the game in the real world. Um, is, is there a cap on how much traffic can go through any individual node? So basically, if, if, if a node is a fantastic mixer and always available, um, it, is, is there a way to guard against um, emerging centralization? Yeah, so in actual fact, um, there is a certain amount, there's a certain number of mix nodes um, that uh, need to be present in the mix net for every time period, every epoch, so to speak. Um, and uh, and that's calculated uh, partially on the basis of how many um, bandwidth credentials are, have been purchased with NIM tokens. So it's a kind of measure of what is the demand going to be like for the next epoch, right? Um, which will then calculate how many mix nodes do we need. And those mixed nodes are distributed across three layers. Um, there is an equal amount of traffic going through every mixed node um, per epoch, basically. So in that sense, there there won't ever be centralization. Um, and there's another element to the, to count to the centralization, which means that um, essentially your you know the the total amount of delegations that you receive as a node you know, will increase the likelihood of your selection for the next round, but only up to a certain point. So there's what's called a soft cap, um, after which, you know, it won't make much difference if like, you know, 20,000 more people delegate to you. Um, yeah. So there's, there's inbuilt kind of, um, let's say, resistance to centralization. And what's the state of this today? So uh, I understand you have a test net live, right? Yeah, so we um, just before everyone broke up for the holiday, we launched our permanent testnet called Sandbox, um, which mimics uh, all the kind of mainnet um, smart contracts and incentive schemes. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and people are more than welcome to, to get involved in, and try it out. It's very important for us to, to kind of give to allow people to to kind of try out running nodes and test out the reward systems and try building things on NIM before they actually kind of get involved in the main net. So we welcome everyone to, to have a look at Sandbox. Final topic we wanted to ask about. Uh, so, you know, you were, Harry, you were on the podcast before where the topic was like about Julian Assange. Uh, and actually we, had, we did a podcast uh, just before the holidays with Amir Taki and uh, some of his co-founders. And then we talked a little bit about about it too. And he mentioned that there was some sort of Assange doll. So I, I was just curious, like, what's what's the update on this? Is this still something like you're involved in? And, and you know, like, what, what's going on there? Oh, I can, I can give a, a quick update on that. Yeah, so I'm... Uh... Uh, old friends with uh, uh, Julian and uh, eventually his family. Um, actually, there's a, there's a quite funny story. When I was having all my problems uh, due to climate change activism, I, I went to see the WikiLeaks launch. I think it was like 2008 or nine at a Chaos Computer Congress that was still in Berlin. And uh, I said to uh, the WikiLeaks folks, I said, look, uh, you're all going to go to jail. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, one of them said, uh, you know, we're not dissidents. We just create tools for dissidents. I said, I don't think the FBI is going to see it that way. Um, and I believe I was right. And then, uh, you know, I felt quite bad about, uh, you know, um, no one is perfect. Uh, obviously, Julian's not perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. Uh, but therefore, you know, no one, particularly for uh, releasing truthful information, uh, deserves to be imprisoned and tortured. Uh, so, you know, I, I visited Julian Embassy and we would discuss uh, lots of topics. Uh, to be honest, he was pretty depressed sometimes. And I would say, well, look, this blockchain stuff, you know, the, these these people from Bitcoin, uh, uh, you know, the CryptoKitties people, whatever you want to call it, they're actually doing really amazing stuff. There's a new, uh, a new social movement happening here. And honestly, he was a little bit skeptical, but he got into it. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when they finally, um, I was, uh, I visited the embassy, I think it was the last person on the guest list uh, before they closed the guest list. And then two or three months later, they busted and took him out, put him in prison. And so I always felt a little bit of a personal responsibility to Julian. 
Now, you know, I mean, we philosophically disagree on some points. I don't believe information, uh, information may be necessary to help uh, freedom, but, you know, f human freedom is, is caused by human social movements and human people, not by technology. Uh, technology can help those social movements. Uh, but nonetheless, I think Julian did a remarkable uh, job uh, in building some crucial parts of technology and releasing uh, a number of very true uh, true things, ending a, a really bloody war in Iraq, and therefore I believe deserves to be supported. Uh, and, you know, it's really hard to support, you know, Particularly in the cryptocurrency space, you think that there would be tons of donations and whatnot, but there kind of isn't. Uh, you know, most people that have Bitcoin would like to hold it so they get more rich. Uh, and so uh, I went with uh, Julian's father to Bitcoin Conference Miami. Uh, I don't think Julian's father was particularly successful in fundraising at that event. Uh, but then we saw all this crazy NFT stuff happening uh, where people were selling NFTs uh, for... Uh, lots of, of, of money. Uh, and I was shocked. I don't own any NFTs. I don't even own any Ethereum. So I don't, uh, I, <laughs> to be honest, it's a separate world for me. I feel a bit, a bit old fashioned, but regardless, uh, I do believe that one of the best things that could happen, uh, for Julian would be if he could raise enough money to pay his lawyers and get out. And I believe, uh, that will hopefully happen, and I believe the family is working on some sort of uh, NFT sale. And of course, just as we've seen in previous sales, DAOs have arisen uh, to help Julian uh, to help uh, and to work on his uh, kind of NFT auction. Now, you know, I'm not part of the the DAO. Uh, I uh, I just connected the DAO. Uh, the people who are in it with his uh, with his family because they're friends of mine and I, I don't want to see uh, Julian Rod in jail. And I, I do think that I, I would like to, regardless of what people think about uh, WikiLeaks per se, uh, you know, I think it's great, but I understand if some people don't, um, no one deserves to be imprisoned and die in jail for releasing information. Uh, you know, I had a previous friend of mine, Aaron Swartz, driven to suicide uh, over this when he released uh, what was actually public information about uh, uh, about the U.S. court system, what's called the PACER database, and then later they kind of kind of blackmailed him over uh, open access data, which now we're seeing is super useful for the world in the form of LibGen. And I think we're going to see more and more of these cases. And I would actually, you know, I mean, regardless of how you feel about the details of each individual cases, I would actually see like to see lots of DAOs form uh, for generically uh, supporting uh, political prisoners, particularly political prisoners on cryptography, but also wider political prisoners who are fighting for human freedom. So this is not just, uh, you know, Virgil Griffith, obviously, uh, was victimized by the U.S. state. I can see, imagine there'll be plenty more in the future. And so I think uh, I really want to support this kind of movement because, to be honest, we're all everyone is talking about funding public goods but one of the public goods that we all take advantage of and we don't even think about is the fact that we are free. We are not imprisoned in a room, uh, unless you're in a COVID lockdown. <laughs> and uh, and we are able to kind of talk to whoever we want to, when we want to. And I think that fundamental freedom should be upheld. And there will be a lot more court cases in the future. So I would like to see the crypto community become more generous and fight for our common our common freedom. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Harry and Jaya. I think that's a great place to wrap up. And it was really a pleasure to uh, yeah, speak with you both about NIM. I'm excited to see like where it's going to go. And I think it's yeah, very needed, definitely. So I hope it's going to be part of lots of crypto wallets and messaging apps soon. Yeah, I mean, the way I think about NIM uh, before saying goodbye is that I think there are many things needed in crypto. And the way to think about them is they're like, each component is like a finger that can make a fist and that fist can kind of fight for our freedom. And NIM is just one very small finger, uh, but we think it's an important one. It's one that no one has built is one that should be built. I do look forward to hearing what everyone else is building and I'll be I'll keep listening to your podcast. So thanks a lot. Where can people come to, to, to find out more about NIM and get involved? 
Um, yeah, so thanks very much for having us on the podcast. And um, I would very much invite people to keep following um, our project. We will be, we are, have already slowly begun to launch the MixNet and take the steps to, 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 towards MainNet, which will come very, very soon. Um, so yeah, you can follow us on, you know, Telegram and Twitter, the usual channels, um, and of course our website. So um, keep an eye. Cool. Thanks so much.